Howdy there once again YouTube. First off, if this intro or video is too long for you, then please utilize the parts section in the description box below. My name is Ben Ferriolo and I'm an amateur seismologist who is actively learning more about seismology and how to monitor volcanic and tectonic hazard areas. If you haven't already, please bookmark my website. It is in the description box below right under my email address. Also remember to share my videos if you like them. That is the main way new people who are interested in this stuff see my channel. Sorry if my voice is very raspy or sounds weird, guys. Yesterday morning I woke up and my voice was quite literally gone. Out of nowhere. I didn't even go to a concert, a scream or anything. I just lost my voice out of nowhere and have a really sore throat. But not in my throat. My sore throat is actually in my bronchial tubes right now, so I'm really hoping I do not have bronchitis, because then if it gets worse, I'm going to sound like this. And then I wouldn't be able to do my videos. Even right now, it's kind of hard for me to speak right now. So just bear with me. Sorry if I sound a little weird today. Moving on, there has been some very interesting stuff. In this video, I will first talk about the minor rapid fire swarm that struck under the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake late yesterday. And then I will quickly review the small swarm that struck near Hebgen Lake this morning, the recent earthquakes at Crater Lake Volcano in Oregon. Yes, there was one recently, guys. It was pretty cool and the recent increase in seismicity for Seattle just in the past day, and then we'll take a quick look at the magnitude 4.0 and subsequent aftershocks in Utah. But first, let's start with that rapid fire swarm. So here we are on my website under the seismic events drop down menu under Yellowstone Supervolcano. Click it and it'll bring you here. And let's go right here. Now, my previous video just quickly overviewed this minor rapid fire swarm and how right after the swarm it probably caused a bunch of low frequency, low amplitude popping of either the crust or the ice layer on top of Yellowstone Lake. I don't know what caused it, but prior to the earthquake swarm, there was no low frequency popping. It happened right when the swarm ended, and um, I'm going to say maybe five hours later, it started to calm down. So the connection is uncanny. It seriously seems like the low frequency popping was related to the swarm in some way. And again, here's my post. This is the old video, the one I just did. But this post on here on my website has much more information than it does on the video. They have not reported any earthquakes or the swarm quite yet. They might soon, but this is the likely swarm epicenter in regards to the four closest seismic stations to the swarm. Borehole 208 fell to the strongest. It only lasted 16 minutes from 09 UTC to 25 UTC. So... Definitely, guys, it was very short, but there were approximately 40 to 45 microquakes at the maximum in that 16-minute time frame. And as stated here, also the first event of the swarm marked as one event in the total estimated count below is likely to be seven or eight very tiny microquakes occurring in such rapid succession that it appears as one event. And we'll take a look at that right here. This was the first event that transpired during the earthquake swarm and did show on another surrounding station. So it was not surface noise, guys. And you can tell, I'm going to say probably seven or eight micro, very, 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 I'm talking about very tiny microquakes, guys. Very tiny. It almost looks like surface noise. Like surface noise building up to something and then kind of going away, you know, like a big truck or something. But it's not. It wasn't. It, you could tell it was part of this earthquake swarm. Here is most of the earthquake swarm. It's, it's, you could see it a lot better with the spectrogram plot right here. Of course, there are frequencies going well beyond 25 hertz. But the majority of the frequencies remain below 10 hertz, especially below 5 hertz as well. As we go down, I do have a slideshow of some of the events right here. Let's go through some of the events, events, shall we? Excuse me. Here is the second event, or in other words, like the ninth or tenth event. Because if you go back, you notice on the first event of the swarm, I don't even know what, what the heck it is, but it does look like a bunch of very teeny tiny microquakes building up to something. And then we go forward and forward. Here's more of the earthquakes within the swarm. I did not detail the entire earthquake swarm, but I did detail most of it within these plots here. Did detail most of them. And it starts back over again. And then over here in this slideshow, I show some of the low frequency popping that was taking place. Notice with dominant frequencies below 5 hertz, actually dominant frequencies usually staying below 3 hertz 
for these events right here, but not going below one hertz. So these are very interesting, They're very tiny guys. They were not major, but they were not present before the swarm and they did appear after the swarm ended. So I don't know what is going on here. And it's somewhat calmed down about five hours or so after the swarm. So it definitely is connected to this rapid fire swarm. Let me show you it on borehole 208. Let's see, here is YLA. Let's go back. B944 kind of showed it, borehole 206. Here's borehole 208. You could tell prior there was pretty much nothing. Here's the earthquake swarm right here. And then see all these little tiny marks afterwards that slowly died down after the swarm? Well, those are the little tiny low frequency poppings that were not present before the swarm. So I am thinking they were caused by the swarm itself. Now let's just take a quick look at the earthquake swarm that was spotted near Hebgen Lake this morning. Here we are at earthquake.usgs.gov at Yellowstone. Here's Yellowstone Lake. Here's Hebgen Lake. Notice, notice it occurred just right down here near Yellowstone Airport, just north actually, on State Route 191 near Madison River and Hebgen Lake. For this earthquake swarm, they are reporting 15 events. They are still not reporting any of the earthquakes in the small rapid fire swarm on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake. They're still not reporting any of them, at least not yet. But they are reporting 15 for the swarm near Hebgen Lake this morning. A 1.0 at 10.4, a 0 0.5 at 8.1, a 1.3 at 9.6 kilometers in depth, a 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 1.1, a 0 0.4, a magnitude 1.1, a 1.5, a 0 0.8, 1.7, 0 0.9, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, and 0 0.3. It looks like from right here, 1.7 to 0 0.9 to 0 0.6 to 0 0.5 to 0 0.3, it got weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. Very interesting right there. So I don't know what was going on here. We are about to take a look at the data for the closest seismic station, which in my opinion was YHL. USGS has it set for a different station, which is YHB, but YHB doesn't show these events like really at all. So we're going to take a look at YHL because it is a little bit more sensitive of a seismic station because it is a broadband station. And also, guys, you can clearly see the earthquakes here on seismic station YHL. This is not an SHZ channel. They do not have SHZ channels for these instruments. This just means, for, for just for the stations of the WY network at Yellowstone, at other places, they do have SHZ channels. But this right here, for the ones at Yellowstone, means that they have a 1 hertz high-pass filter added to these graphs. Because look, YHL, notice how... The background noise looks pretty straight, right? Well, let's go to the Seismic Program Swarm. This is YHL from the same instrument, but the HHZ channel. Well, they don't have an SHZ channel, so if I wanted to get rid of these background microseisms, I would have to add a 1 hertz high-pass filter. Sadly, the Seismic Program Swarm does not allow you to filter the helicorders yet. Not yet. I'm trying to get the developers of the Seismic Program Swarm to add that in the program. I'm trying, guys. But we see... On YHL, it started primarily around 9 UTC, so that is the mark that we will start at. And going down, you can see it showed up on many surrounding stations, even all the way to YNR did uh, pick up some of these earthquakes, even as far away as Borhole 208 as well. So a lot of these were felt over a broad area. Okay, so we're quickly going to take a look at these via the spectrogram, but I want to turn persistent rescale off, have the overlap set to 95, and I am going to set a 0 0.6 hertz high pass filter because I do want to get rid of those pesky background microseisms, but not too much though, because sometimes low frequency activity can occur around 0 0.6 hertz. Usually it doesn't, but I'm just saying it can occur. Now we're just going to go through just real quick. Tiny, tiny microquakes here and there, guys. Very tiny popping. Very, very tiny. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Actually, whoops. I think I missed one, guys. I think I definitely missed one. Because it started at 9 UTC, remember? So I did miss one. Let's pan this down just real quick. You already know it's Seismic Station YHL. And there. We have the first earthquake right here at 9 UTC. Almost exactly 9 UTC which was a 1.0 at 10.4 kilometers in depth. And it was this one right there. That was the first earthquake of this swarm. At least that's what it seems. Now, as we move forward, we see more tiny popping and popping and popping. Not much, not much. Calms down 
pretty much a lot until right around, let's see, what is the time? It starts to increase almost around 12 UTC or so. Then we see some more uh, microquakes occurring. Some of them occurring in very rapid succession. Look at this. Multiple events. Tiny though, but they're events nonetheless. <clears throat> There's the, one of them right there. But again, they are. some of them are occurring in rapid succession, which I find is very interesting. Not all of them though. Trust me, we see much more interesting rapid fire swarms on the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake, around Yellowstone Lake, and around West Thumb Lake as well. Usually in that area, recently near Shoshone Lake too, and somewhat near Amethyst Mountain. We have seen events transpire there too. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that is it. And I do have the most recent data stream as of 12.38 p.m. Pacific Time, February 20th, 2019. Let's go forward to the most recent. That is a teleseism. Let's see, not seeing much. Don't know what this is right here. This is interesting. Check this out. Whoa, buddy. What is that? That does not look like a regional earthquake or a, uh, that does not look like a teleseism either. But it does only go to about 100 amplitude count, which is very, very weak, guys. So I will keep an eye on this right now. But it does have lower frequencies. Notice that. Dominant frequencies of this event remain around, let's check it out, remain below 1 hertz with a spike at about, I'm going to say 3 hertz or so. So it wasn't too crazy. The swarm was not crazy at all, but I am expecting more swarming to continue soon. And by the way, guys, I do have something amazing for you. I am putting out a new section on my website and a video to go on that website as well, on that page on my site as well, excuse me. Um, it's going to be, you, you know, the GPS deformation charts put out by volcanoes.usgs.gov and UNAVCO and other places. The GPS deformation charts that show north-south horizontal deformation, east-west horizontal deformation, and also shows uplift or subsidence via the vertical chart at the bottom. Well, I've always wanted to make my own charts for whatever time period I want, for either five days, six days, six months, you know what I mean? I've always wanted to have the freedom to make my own charts, just like I have the freedom to make my own seismic plots. Well, guess what? I found out how to do it. You can make your own GPS charts, guys, and I'm going to show you how to do that in the coming days. I'm working on that right now, and it is a little confusing at first, and I'm still learning it. I'm still learning the ropes, but it is very, very I think it's a lot more accurate than using the online GPS deformation charts, unless you're looking back like 10 or 20 years. If you want a whole range of 10 or 20 years, then you should probably use the ones online. But if you want a more short time period to see the most recent data stream spread out over a broad area so you can really look at what's going on, then this will be for you. And just stay tuned for that. I'll have that out soon. So, moving on, guys. Did you know that an earthquake recently struck Crater Lake? Did you know that? Yeah. Of course, we should see earthquakes here from time to time, but it is notable when an area this quiet sees an earthquake. So, why don't we go check it out? But first, I just real quick want to tell you guys about Crater Lake if you don't even know what it is. Crater Lake partly fills one of the most visually spectacular calderas of the world. Yes, it's a caldera, guys. An 8 by 10 kilometer, 5 by 6 miles basin, more than 0 0.6 miles deep, or 1 kilometer deep, formed by the collapse of a volcano known as Mount Mazama during a series of explosive eruptions about 7,700 years ago. Having a maximum depth of 1,949 feet, Crater Lake is the deepest lake in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, guys, okay, can you imagine Mount Rainier just blowing? I'm, I'm talking, it used to be Mount Mazama, right? Which is pretty much just like another stratovolcano, like any other volcano, guys. It turned into a caldera from a stratovolcano because it blew up just extra extraordinarily, guys. I mean, it just, it blew, literally blew its top and its base. I mean, it was, it's just gone. Can you imagine Mount Rainier blowing, but not just the top, just the entire mountain, just gone? <laughs> Pretty crazy. Okay, so Mount Mazama straddles the Cascade Volcanic Axis and is a cluster of overlapping stratovolcanoes that is the most voluminous quaternary uh, volcanic system in the Oregon Cascades. The volcano's compound edifice has been actively 
oh, excuse me, has been active relatively continuously since about supposedly 420,000 years ago, and it is built mostly of andesite and dacite until it began erupting rhyodacite about 30,000 years ago, ramping up to the caldera forming eruption. Excellent preservation and easy access made Mount Mazama, Crater Lake Caldera, and the deposits formed by the climactic eruption constitute a natural laboratory for study of volcanic and magmatic processes. Research relating to the caldera forming eruption has been of fundamental importance to volcanologists, helping them to understand large explosive eruptions, compositional zonation in magma chambers, and collapsed caldera mechanisms. The climactic eruption. Listen to this, guys. The climactic eruption is also the source of the widespread Mazama ash, a useful Holocene stratigraphic marker throughout the Pacific Northwest, adjacent Canada, and offshore. What? Guys, did you know that when this thing erupted, pretty much the whole United States was covered in ash, guys? Seattle, I mean, Seattle wasn't there, obviously, but I'm just saying, guys, wow, it was huge, way bigger than Newberry. Actually, you know, I think Newberry was a little bit bigger than this during its caldera-forming eruption, but notice, very high. They still have it set to very high. It still has a very active magma chamber down there, but it is usually very, very seismically quiet. So why don't we go take a look at some of the recent earthquakes? All right, guys, here we are at the USGS Earthquake Catalog, which is a good tool, tool to see uh, reported earthquake events. And let's go down here. Let's set the boundary to right about there just so everything related to the active magma chamber can be seen if it's reported. Okay, now we're going to go all the way back to January 1st, 1980, magnitude negative 1 and above. So that means you're going to see every single earthquake that's ever been reported for Crater Lake since 1980 on January 1st. Now let's scroll down and press search. And let's see what it gives us. Guys, since January 1st, 1980, there were 20 events. That's it, guys. That's it since 1980. That's January 1st, 1980 is even before Mount St. Helens erupted, guys. My goodness, do you see this? This is pretty crazy. Let's see, the most recent was this one right here that was reported just not too long ago. Okay, so here it is, the most recent earthquake I'm going to show, which occurred on February 17th, 2019. At 737 UTC was a 0.9 at 1.7 kilometers in depth. Just on the southeastern rim, I'm going to say, right under there. And the most recent one before that occurred on December 1st, 2018. And it was a 0 0.8 at 0 0.6 kilometers in depth. Next one occurred October 8th, 2017. Next one was January 24th, 2017. So let's see how many occurred each year, shall we? In 2010, there was an explosion, which was most likely a quarry blast. Let's go down. Okay, so ever since 1994. So I had it set to 1980, right? So from 1980 to 1994, which is 14 years, there were no reported earthquake events for Crater Lake at all. Then, all of a sudden, on January 26, 1994, we see a 1.6 at 36.5 kilometers in depth, which is pretty deep, actually. Then there was a 2.3 on December 29, 1994. Then, look at this. Three, guys. Oh, my God. Do you see this? Wow, they had an earthquake swarm. An earthquake swarm at Crater Lake is pretty rare, guys, because it's usually very quiet. Again, only 20 reported earthquake events since 1980. That's so super quiet, guys. It's pretty crazy quiet. But there were three reported events for December 29th. 1994, a 2.3 at negative 0 0.2 kilometers in depth. Remember, 0 kilometers exactly in depth is surface uh, sea level, actually. So you got to account the uh, elevation in there. So it still did occur underground, guys. 2.6 at negative 0 0.6 kilometers in depth. And then a 2.4. So a 2.3, 2.6, and a 2.4 all on the same day. Then there was nothing for three years until all of a sudden on March 15, 1997, a 2.0 at 1.7 kilometers in depth struck far to the south of Mount Mazama, also known as Crater Lake. Then in 1997, uh, in, what is that? That's July 15th, 1997, there was a 1.6 at 2.3 kilometers in depth, far to the northwest. Then we had another one right here in 2008, 
In 2010, there was that explosion. In 2013, there was another earthquake. And then let's go up. In 2014, actually, it seems like we have the highest count. There's a 0 0.8 at 38 or 35.8 kilometers in depth, excuse me. <clears throat> then there's a 1.3 at 46.4 kilometers in depth. Look at how deep these are, guys. Look at that. And then we had a 0 0.2 up here in 2014 again and a negative 0 0.5, which is like pretty much one of the smallest. Actually, no, wait. We have one of the smallest right up here, a negative 0 0.7. Oh, my God. Yeah, I think this is actually the smallest earthquake I've ever seen reported in my life, guys. That's pretty small. And then in 2015, we had a 0 0.6. And yeah, so it doesn't seem like activity is increasing or decreasing. It just seems to be going up and down, up and down each year. But again, only 20 reported events, actually 19 if you take out the explosion. So let's say 19 reported earthquakes since 1980. Again, I would like to take a look at the most recent event, again, which was a magnitude 0 0.9 at 1.7 kilometers in depth. Let's take a quick look at the seismic data from the closest seismic station. Now here we are in the seismic program swarm in the station WIZ in the CC network, short period vertical. Now, I real quick want to say this is a teleseism right here, blatant teleseism. You can obviously tell with dominant frequencies remaining, definitely, yeah, definitely teleseism, remaining about 0 0.5 hertz right there. But let's turn persistent rescale off, log power, set overlap to 95, and we are set. Now, let's take a look at the most recent earthquake at Crater Lake, which hasn't happened for quite a while. Here it is right here at 737.51 about, yep, almost exactly right on the dot. There it is. Dominant high frequencies. Let's check out the spectra just real quick. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's turn log frequency off as well just so we can see the whole shebang. Yeah, it seems to be leading up to about, what is that? I'm going to say 10.6 hertz. Leading up to about 10.6 hertz. Then after that, it starts to die down. But again, we did see an earthquake at Crater Lake just a few days ago. Also known, Crater Lake is also known as Mount Mazama. Used to be a stratovolcano like Rainier, Hood, like any other stratovolcano, but it just completely just gone. Blew into the sky, quite literally. Blew its top. But yep, again, take a look at the waveforms real quick. Definitely a high frequency volcano tectonic earthquake, which is normal for this area. We should see volcano tectonic earthquakes every now and then. Doesn't mean anything bad's coming. Doesn't mean that, guys. But just keep an eye out for more. If we saw more of these and an increase in activity, then it would be something to watch. But as of right now, Crater Lake, also known as Mount Mazama, is still pretty quiet. Now let's real quick talk about the recent seismicity for Seattle. So here we are for Washington State. I live right about right there, right where I'm clicking, right there. But uh, about 20 miles northeast of Seattle. But I just want to say this is since 0 UTC on February 19th. 2019 so it's just a little bit over a day's worth of seismicity there was pretty much nothing i think this occurred at mount st helens just one earthquake at mount st helens a quarry blast down here two lonely earthquakes here but i want to put my focus on this right here as of right now there is no ets episodic tremor and slip going on in this area which is sometimes when we see these earthquakes and some larger earthquakes usually appear when episodic tremor and slip does occur but i don't think it's happening that crazy right now but we did see some earthquakes just look at this just in the past 24 hours all of these in the past 24 hours as of 103 p.m pacific time february 20th 2019 the first one occurred at 723 UTC and was a magnitude 2.2 at 23.8 kilometers in depth. Remember, the Seattle Fault runs right along here and has not ruptured for 1,100 years. Yes, guys, it hasn't ruptured since two or three Cascadia subduction zones. <laughs> you know, like it, uh, Cascadia subduction zone ruptured what? I'm going to say maybe, what was it? 300 400 years ago i believe and it does it every 300 400 years or something like that so we're overdue for a cascadia mega quake but the seattle fault itself hasn't ruptured since long before that since 1100 years ago guys so i think seattle is overdue for two major earthquakes a magnitude 7 on the seattle fault and a magnitude 9 on the cascadia subduction zone now you may ask yourself ben there is already a major earthquake in 2001. 
in February, on February 28th, 2001, I remember it, guys, because I was through it, and it freaked me out, guys. It was a strong earthquake, ran downstairs, put my ear to the ground, and you could hear the ground rumbling. No joke, and it felt like you were on a ship on the ocean. It was pretty cool. But I just want to say the Seattle Fault did not, it was not responsible for that magnitude 7 Nisqually quake. Actually, it was downgraded to a magnitude 6.8. I'm just going to call it a magnitude 7. But the Nisqually earthquake happened far down here, I believe, on the Tacoma Fault. I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But the Seattle Fault has yet to have a magnitude 6.8 or 7 earthquake since 1,100 years ago. So I believe the Seattle Fault is definitely overdue, and we could be seeing that any month or any day now. You don't hear the professionals talking about that much. Because the Seattle Fault, it's not dead, guys. There are still active earthquakes that do occur on that fault. But then, again, I just want to say 2.2 near Enitai, Washington, 23.8 kilometers in depth. Then we had a 0 0.9 near Bainbridge Island on 13.8 kilometers in depth. Then a 0 0.8 at 4.6 just to the south of that one. Then near Normandy Park, there's, there's a 1.6 and 19.7 kilometers in depth. And then just barely to the northeast, there is a 1.8 at 22.9 kilometers in depth. One person reported feeling it. Right now, I'm going to take a look at the seismic data for this event right here from the closest seismic station. Now, here we are in the seismic program swarm with the closest seismic station's data added. And we have MNWA in the UW network actually says HNZ. Whenever you see uh, an N in the middle, because usually it says H here, right? Usually it would say HHZ, not HNZ. In my experience, the N usually means strong motion. I do not like strong motion instruments, guys. Of course, they got some really good stuff associated with them. They're great instruments, whatever. But mainly, I like to use broadband and short period stations, guys. I do not like strong motion much because it usually does not show the weaker activity. And let me go down here to the earthquake. This was the magnitude 2.2 reportedly at 23.8 kilometers in depth at 723 UTC at the 44 second mark. Yep, took a few seconds to travel to this station, but here, let's turn on Persistent Rescale off, Overlap 95, press OK, and here it is right here on the spectrogram. Dominant high frequencies is a very strange looking earthquake, almost looked like an explosion in some ways, but there were no low frequencies uh, involved, because usually explosions farther away from the explosion epicenter on the surface usually carry more lower frequencies as it travels. Dominant high frequencies, once again, going well beyond 25 hertz. This was a very strange earthquake and was associated with many other earthquakes in the area during this time. So, what do you think about the Seattle Fault, guys? Do you think that it is overdue? I mean, obviously it's overdue. It's been 1,100 years. I mean, the Cascadia subduction zone within 1,100 years has, have already ruptured twice. But the Seattle Fault hasn't? I mean, uh, man... I don't know, guys. I think it's really building up a lot of pressure. And with that new Alaskan Way Viaduct Tunnel, was it SR-99? I'm never driving in that thing, guys. I am never driving in that thing, I swear. One of my worst fears is being buried alive. And guess what would happen if there was a major magnitude 7 right at Seattle or a major magnitude 9 just off the coast? Guess what would happen? That whole area would liquefy, guys, which means you would be buried alive in, like, liquid sand. Like quicksand. Imagine everything around you turning to quicksand while you're under in that tunnel. Yeah. No thanks, guys. I think I'd way rather walk to Seattle. <laughs> Real quick, let's take a look at the magnitude 4.0 that just recently struck Utah just last night, and then we'll be over. Here we are at earthquake.usgs.gov. Once again, notice there have been seven reported earthquakes for Utah. Actually, a total of 11, but I'm not going to get into it. Up here near Salt Lake City, they have been seeing some very strange low-frequency events, guys. Um, kind of weak, but very strange low-frequency events that do show on multiple surrounding stations. I'm still analyzing those. They don't make any sense. Almost looked like repeated quarry blasts over and over and over and over again. But I... I, I don't know. They were very strange. Still analyzing that. They are they already had pretty much like two earthquake swarms up here near Salt Lake City. Remember, Utah is very volcanic as well, just like Nevada, Arizona, uh, Eastern California, places like that. Even Idaho, guys. Even Idaho can be everywhere's volcanic. You know what? I'm just gonna say the whole world is just one big volcano. <laughs> but down here we do have a 
an earthquake swarm once again. Seven to eight reported earthquakes. Let's see. Actually, they are reporting eight. It just said seven, so they must have just added a brand new one, just right was as I was speaking. Just to the, I'm going to say, west-southwest of Richfield near Old Cove Fort. Let's zoom in and see if there's any interesting features. White Sage Flat. Let's see, there's a valley. Not seeing any cinder cones around this area. Sergeant Mountain Cinder Crater. <laughs> Look at that. We found a volcano, guys. We found one. There is a cinder cone right down here. Now, Utah, again, the crust is very th uh, thin in these areas. So, I'm not saying this is caused by magma, guys, but I'm just saying the possibility remains. Magnitude 2.2 and a magnitude 4.0. This was the largest of the earthquake swarm and, was, and supposedly was felt by multiple people. Again, magnitude 4.0 at 8.2 kilometers in depth. 64 people already reported to USGS that they felt it. Here's the moment tensor, fault plane solution. It looks very strange. It looks almost perfect, guys. That's very interesting. Uh, but let's move on. I'm going to see what is the closest seismic station to this large magnitude 4 and subsequent earthquake swarm arrival time up tcru hhz so why don't we open up the most recent data stream for tcru here we have the most recent data stream a little less than 24 hours worth uh, i'm probably gonna say 18 hours or so that doesn't matter tcru in the uu network location code 01 broadband vertical now i was going to add a filter because this is a broadband station and the microseisms in the background are very strong but I do not want to do that yet. I would like to show you something. Check this out. Here's the earthquake, right? And there's the large magnitude 4.0. Look at what happens. Do you see this? Look at the data stream. Watch. It moves. How is that possible? Look at that. Do you see that? How is that even possible? I don't know. Look at that. It's almost like there was like a very slow earthquake at that time. Look at this. Isn't that weird? Oh my god, that is so odd. Here, and let me zoom in again. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. I don't know if this is a malfunction from the closest seismic station to the swarm, but it doesn't just show on the seismogram plot. No, no, no. Check it out. Okay, look right here how you can see some activity. Look how it changes. Okay, 070450, right there. It's, watch, it's going to change. Whoa, what's that? What is that? Do you see that? That's the same thing that was causing the stream to, I don't know, go wavy? I don't know what to call it. Look at those designs, too. Looks like ripples in a pond. I don't even know what is going on here. This has got to be some type of major malfunction or something because it just appears out of nowhere. Look at that. And then let's go to the spectra. And let's look at the dominant frequencies of this weird wavy thingy right here. Look at that. And then, aha, here it is right here. There is no dominant frequency. Guess what the dominant frequency is? Nothing. The strongest frequency of this weirdness is nothing. There is 0 0.0000, as many zeros as you can add, nothing. But it shows there is strength there. How is that possible? To me, that's physically impossible. But... I'm going to move on and let that simmer a little bit. Tell me what you guys think about that. Now, I added a filter to get rid of the pesky background microseisms and the weird stuff. So let me zoom out. Okay. So we did have, this was the magnitude 2.2, and here's the magnitude 4.0 right here. Let's check the dominant frequencies just real quick. Dominant frequencies start to drop at about 13 hertz, I'm going to say. But the strongest frequencies did remain below 5 hertz. But it was not a low-frequency earthquake, but still. Now let's go forward. Another earthquake, another earthquake, another earthquake. Many, 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 many. Kind of looks like... Now, for those who follow me and my interest in the rapid-fire swarms at Yellowstone, you will notice that these look very, very similar to the rapid-fire energetic swarms that occur in and around West Thumb Lake at Yellowstone. Don't they look very similar? Let's go forward. Many earthquakes throughout. And then we have some weird low-frequency something going on among the mix. Uh, these are what I've been studying lately, guys. See this dominant low frequencies right there? These are what I've been studying lately. I don't know what they are, but some of them do appear on surrounding stations. Very weird. Sine waves. 
Don't know why we would be seeing sine waves here, especially on multiple surrounding stations. I, I don't know, guys. I don't know. That's why I'm still looking into. But just know there is a possibility this earthquake swarm did coincide with some low-frequency events. But the low-frequency events are very strange. They're unlike any low-frequency events I have ever seen. Again, going through many, 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 many aftershocks. Some occurring in rapid succession, some not. There's some more right there. Let's go back. Almost looks like these are two earthquakes occurring at the same time. Yep, they are two earthquakes occurring at the same exact time. And there we go right there. And as of the most recent data stream, as of 1.20 p.m. Pacific time, February 20th, 2019, here's the most recent data stream down here. It seems like these low frequency events or whatever they are. Look at this. Look, it's almost perfect sine waves too. But whatever these are, they are increasing as of the past hour or so. I don't know what that means. And yes, they some of them do show on surrounding seismic stations. So I am definitely going to be looking into this more. You know, it's not that big of a stretch to say that that uh, the salt flats of Utah or even other areas in Utah, Nevada will someday very soon see some type of lava eruption or some new cinder cone form apparently they say it happens what once every 1000 years so like a new cinder cone forms well guess what it's been about 900 years since the last one guys so i'm thinking we're getting close to seeing another one guys it's, it'll be very interesting and don't worry if any volcano were to erupt in the united states i would hightail it to the volcano and record it for you guys and keep an eye on the seismic activity and all that good stuff and just for shits and giggles, we have MCID in the WY network. This is the helicorder actually called Webby Quarter, generated by the University of Utah. This was not generated by myself. I just want to tell you real quick that the 4.0 in Utah showed right there. Yeah, it was that strong. It showed all the way to Yellowstone, guys. So, guys, we really did talk about a lot today. Sorry again if my voice sounds raspy or it's hard to hear me. Hopefully, I will be getting it back soon. Keep an eye on your local hazard areas, and remember to always have a disaster plan and a kit ready, just in case. God bless, guys, and I will be back soon. Ben Ferriolo, signing off.